Hello and welcome to the YouTube podcast series of Cities ABC and Open Business Council. Now, I'm Hilton Super, the Vice Chairman of the Student Group, and today I have the pleasure of speaking to Laura Freeburn Smith, who's author of Abundance Leaders Creating Energy, Joy, and Productivity in the Unsettled World. Now, this is where we interview people who are changing the world, people who are inspiring us with their achievements, their creativity, their acumen, and the use of technology. Now, in previous interviews, we have interviewed over 300 amazing people and achieved more than 15 million views on YouTube. Now, this interview series on Cities ABC is in partnership with our platforms at Business Council, a Web3 4IR-based platform utilizing technologies that employ the use of truth and trust through the unique corporate digital identity using blockchain and the deployment of data analytics, AI, and machine learning. Now, Today, I'd like to introduce you to Laura Freeborn Smith. Hello. <laughs> so tell us, Laura, where, whereabouts are you? I am sitting in Woodbridge, Connecticut, in the United States, which is right near New Haven, Connecticut, which some people know because Yale University is located there. Yeah. And I'm sitting in one of the conference rooms of my management consulting firm that I'm a partner at and is mentioned in the book quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So this room is actually called The Meadow, uh, and it's, we talk about space in the book. But mm -hmm. anyway, that's where I'm sitting, yes. So in, in, in the book, you talk about putting self-awareness at the top of your list of required meta-competencies, and you demonstrate how to develop an abundance mindset and avoid the opposite of what we're familiar with, which is the scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. which is why the former foster fosters and creates a high performance work environment our economy our economies basically urgently need hmm. so you know, I, I, that's a such a robust question um <laughs> so let me <laughs> should i i might i might start i'm going to take a step back and sure. just talk a little bit about maybe the abundance versus scarcity mental models Yes. And then because I think that'll help explain why they are so useful, why the abundance mindset is so useful in mm -hmm. business. But also we find people use it in their personal life. We won't talk a lot about that today unless it interests your mm -hmm. viewership and others. But I, I did want to mention that. But let me just talk about the mental models a little bit. And first of all, let me say it's not an either or in any individual. The, you, you're not a pure abundance mental model or pure scarcity. People mm -hmm. do have a valence to see the world through one of lens more frequently than another. Um, and let's just talk even another step back and talk about mental models. So mental mm -hmm. models are the way that each of us explains the world to ourselves. So I know you mentioned you were raised in South Africa. So your mental model of the world probably has a beautiful map of Africa in it. And it might then have a bit of Europe in, you know, and your mental model of the world will have certain countries larger in your mental map than other countries. Mm -hmm. So your mental map, Vietnam might be a very small country in that mental model that you're always making sense of the physical world. Same thing is true for our relationships. We have mental models of how relationships should be based on our families of origin, what I call our organizations of origin, usually our schools, places of worship. Um, and we build our, our and also in cult, acculturation, being told, you know, what women should be like or men should be like. Mm -hmm. So those mental models we use to do sense making of the world and we react to the world based on those. So now just moving back up into abundance models versus scarcity. The abundance model, mental model, is one that says, whatever I encounter, I trust that I can navigate it. I trust that I can find a positive outcome in this. I trust that they, that we will be okay in some way, but it's not naive. Look, of course there are settings where people are not okay, war and others, but this is um, um, an abundance mental model is particularly useful for navigating typical business challenges, personal challenges, et cetera. And at the core, core of that model is optimism. And in the book, the readers will see there's a there's an entire chapter, I believe, devoted to optimism. There's a big section of a chapter. And that's based on Martin Seligman's work. I think he's passed away, very famous psychologist from the United States. 
Um, and the woman who wrote the um, book on grit, and her name's going to come to me, Duck, Angela Duckworth, uh, studied with him. So he's got a very profound effect on psychology and social psychology. But anyway, he wrote a lot about optimism. And at the core of abundance mental models is this ability to see a difficult situation and say, how can we do something good with this? There's one other, and then I'll stop because I know we've got a lot of other questions to tackle, but I think there's one other critical piece of the abundance mental model. And that is that an abundance mental model person feels that there are enough resources in the world for everyone. Mm -hmm. They don't hoard power. They don't hoard resources. They know when they have enough and having more is going to hurt others. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very interesting relationship to power and resources uh, and ambition. You know, ambition can really do a lot of damage. It's brilliant as a driver in many ways. It's produced extraordinary things in the world. But ambition without a sensibility of relationship to its impact can be very destructive. And we've seen that in the last millennia. Mm -hmm. So let me stop there. That, that's a lot of material to, to chew on. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking so forward to really unpicking this, but I'd look, your journey of getting here, I mean, the moment mm. you're the founder of OPG, which is an organizational performance group, yeah, specializing in the development of leadership. And, you know, you're focusing on shaping, you know, organization, culture, teaching, you're doing a lot of research, strategic consulting, etc. When yeah. you started, where did this all start? I mean, you went to university, you went to Berkeley, and then you went yeah. to Yale, and then Saybrook. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Okay. So I, if, if, if you'll bear with me, I, I want to start the journey where I was born because yeah. those academic endeavors grew out of choices my parents made and the background. And as you already mentioned, Hilton, one of the major pieces of being an abundance leader is self-awareness. It's one of the four meta competencies. Mm -hmm. And we encourage people to go all the way back through their childhood and look at that journey that brought them into leadership and make sense of that. So bear with me and I'll just give you, give the viewership and you some highlights that will help them understand why I wrote the book. And I also say when I'm teaching, when I start a course, I say, I want to tell you about my personal background so that you understand my lens and you can decide whether you agree with it, you disagree, you can say, oh, of course she would say that given her background or whatever comes up for you. But I think it's important as leaders, as speakers, as teachers, that we're also clear what our bias is. And where that bias came from. Okay. So let me, so I was actually born on an Air Force base in Montana. My parents met at Stanford and both came from WASP backgrounds, white Anglo Saxon Protestant backgrounds, and relatively wealthy. So I'm very clear about the privilege and pathways that opened for me as a result of that. And I, I don't want to be naive about how difficult. The pathways I journeyed on might be for other people to get access to. It's gotten better in my lifetime, but it may be not so great. So I was born in Montana to two parents who were very creative. Uh, my father was is an architect, just retired, urban planner. My mother started two hospices. And my father, then a mother went to Boston. He went to MIT. And then we went on to Rome. And here's where one of those critical experiences is that informs who I am. We lived in Rome for two years. My father was doing his architecture internship. And I went to Montessori, the original Montessori in Rome. Mm -hmm. And that was a game changer for how I viewed education and my parents viewed education. And my parents gave me one of the most extraordinary educations that's available on the planet. I didn't know it at the time, but when I reflected on it, I thought what brilliant choices they made. So we came back from Italy. I was five years old and they moved back to San Francisco. They had always intended to do that. And I ended up in public school for a period of time. We lived in a town called Sausalito, which if you've ever been to San Francisco, it's right across the way. And my parents got involved quite deeply in social, the social justice movement and the civil rights movement, both the women's liberation. My mother was on the Sausalito school board and helped integrate the Sausalito schools we had death threats. The FBI tapped our phones. 
Um, I was in anti-Vietnam marches on most weekends as a young person. So I, I come from a very radical so- social justice liberal background. Mm-hmm. So you fast forward a little bit. I went to also a, a, an exceptional high school called the Urban School of San Francisco, which is highly studied by other high schools. It has a different idea about the maturity of teenagers and how to interact with them as real adults. And the learning is done in two, three hour segments every day. Chemistry for three hours, English for three hours. Very different model than most schools. Mm -hmm. I won't go into that so much, but that also informed how I think about education. And I think about my right to have a voice in the world. You know, I was very encouraged by adults to have a voice. This ties to abundance leaders because abundance leaders want to encourage all their staff to feel empowered to have a voice. Okay. So I, I went through high school. I went off um, to Berkeley. I actually went to Vassar for two years. It wasn't a good fit for me. It was a little too privileged and cloistered from the life I had come from. And it, it's not a disparagement of Vassar. You know, it, it's changed quite a bit. But at that time, it was a long time ago, 40 years ago. So I went to Berkeley. I graduated from Berkeley and I knew I wanted to go overseas. I majored in philosophy and political science. <laughs> and my brother said, how will you ever make any money? And I said, I don't know. I just like to think. I like to write. I like to think. So I went off to work in a refugee camp for four years. I worked on the Thai-Cambodian border in two different refugee camps for four years as the education coordinator. Had about a thousand staff under me, Cambodian and expatriate. And I was 25. I got very burned out, applied to graduate school and ended up at, at Yale. Now, this is where I start to part ways a little bit from my family's paradigm. Not extremely, but I go off to business school. You take radical social justice activists and their daughter goes to business school. (laughs) My my father was a little bit like, really? Okay. So I went to the Yale School of Management and had the transformative education of a lifetime. I figured out, it helped me figure out how organizations work. And organizations make the world turn. Mm -hmm. It is a fundamental language that I think almost everyone should be trained in. How does accounting work? How does finance work? And that's what I majored in at Berkeley was accounting and finance. And how does uh, marketing work and production? Because all of those disciplines are driving your and my daily experience, what we buy somewhere, the car we drive, the limitations of government, everything. So that, that combination of that background and the business degree gave me a different understanding of the world. I think a deeper, more nuanced understanding of the world than I might have had otherwise. Let me stop there and I can go on to sort of then where the abundance leadership showed up. But you know, let me stop there. Any thoughts? No, it, 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 I mean, it, it's that's the most fascinating thing. that, And the clear takeaway is that the framing of everything that we do, go, as you say, goes back to when we were growing up and yeah. the influences and the environment, the, 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 you know, I mean, like myself brought up in Africa. So my, you know, and, and, and very similar to you, my parents on that liberal spectrum because of social injustice, political injustice and things like that in Africa. So that does shape me as, as who I am. So I completely yeah. understand where you are. And then like you, I ended up going up to to university. I went to Oxford Brooks, did engineering, and then went into the city of London and finance and yada, yada, yada. And all the things that I'm doing today in technology reflects all that past and how I strongly believe that technology through education, education, is probably the most empowering thing that you can give to to society, which empowers them to do what they can in the 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 environment their their environment and this subject you've come up with just abundance versus scarcity really really want to understand a lot a lot a lot a lot more about it yeah um and i think we've got we've got plenty of time so let me let me just grab onto a couple of things you said that i thought were intriguing uh you mentioned that you went and studied engineering yeah that's such a crisp mental model. What a powerful layering on for you uh, of your South Africa, you know, childhood. And then engineering has such a distinct language 
and the way it deconstructs the world and thinks about things. And so part of being an abundance leader is thinking about how that's transformed you. And that comment also brought up something, Hilton, that I think leaders, whether we're talking about abundance leaders or not, it's helpful for them to be aware of, which is this. If you think about your childhood and your educational training, that that asks for a certain type of behavior from you it, as an organizational citizen, a family mm-hmm. citizen, a religious organization citizen, a school citizen. What's interesting to me is that leap from those organizations into work. Often there's a whole new set of demands for behavior at work that nobody's getting trained for, or they've been overtrained to obey and follow and, you know, do the right thing and do what you're told and have respect for authority, all of which are, are okay in a certain measure, but overplayed, you bring those into organizational life and people are just following what they're being told. The innovation isn't there, the, that kind of beautiful mix. So that, that's just a comment to think about that. And one other, just to build on your comment about technology and education, two, two of my greatest passions are income inequality and education inequality. I'm I'm with you. I'm a complete believer that education changes everything. Everything. Science-based, fact-based education is a complete game changer. No, you're absolutely right. In in terms of case, of thinking about what's characterized you in terms of the three areas that you focus on, which is creating organization cultures, teaching and research, which we've, 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 we've come across, and then your consulting expertise. So going back to creating organization cultures, you talk about, I, I want to believe, humanistic values. Yeah. Yeah. And those humanistic values, I think, are really, really key because that's where the empowerment comes from, is to allow those humanistic values to fit within an organization. Yeah, I agree. So let me, you, shall I talk a little bit about those humanistic values and kind sure. of what they look like? Yeah. Um, and I think this is tricky. I think this is a very tricky area as a leader because sometimes we interpret humanistic values as I have to bend over backwards for everybody. I have to completely cater to their needs. I can't say anything that might be slightly triggering. Uh, Whatever issues they've got going on, I have to tiptoe around it. The organization has to do everything in order to take care of people. And this is the wrong direction. The other end of that spectrum is I don't care how people feel. I don't care what's happening to them. I don't care about our impact on our community or the environment. All I care about is profit and I'll do any cost. I mean, these are the two extremes, right? So the dance for leaders is to find that middle ground that works for their organization, their community and their staff that holds appropriate boundaries, healthy boundaries. Some behavior is just not okay in in certain settings or organizations. Um, Sometimes we can't do everything we want for the community around us. We don't have the funds, we don't have the profit margin. So an abundance leader thinks about how do I manifest compassion, care, awareness of the impact within what's possible and what's appropriate, not not excessive in one direction or another. Let me give you an example at OPG. A few years ago, we had a lot of discussion about standard English, the use of standard English, what used to be called the Queen's English, you know, or standard uh, American English. And some younger staff took offense at that. They wanted to be able to speak in any vernacular that they wanted. Our problem is that for management consulting, who we work with, we must use top level business English. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go into the creative spaces, go to Hollywood, go make music. It's absolutely fine. So this is the dance we're in right now as an entire species is we're learning together about how, when should we adapt individually? When should the organization adapt? And what are the shared values we're trying to manifest in those adaptations to one another? Complicated. Very complicated because you have, you know, you build very diverse organizations with diverse people in that organization from completely diverse backgrounds. And how do you knit that all together in a framework that is not going to prejudice certain members of the of your of your company? 
Yeah. Do you want to take what they have and then put them in the role that they are best suited to fulfill the, the common vision or the common mission of, of yeah. the organization? And I'm a believer, and people might disagree with me, that not everyone is suited for every organization. And the organization has to call that shot sometimes. Look, this is not a fit for your competency. It's not a fit for how you want to be in the world. The parts of you that are important to your identity that you want to manifest. You know, there's there can be a whole variety of reasons. You know, you're not a, you're not a team player, and teams are important here. It's just not it's not who you are. Um, and so, what I always try to do when we're working with people who aren't a good fit is say, look, this isn't about you being a bad person in some way. It's let's get you on a career path that fits who you want to be and what you want to manifest in the world. This is not the place, right? So, but in really big organizations, like you take Yale University, Yale University is a microcosm of the entire planet. You've got geology, astronomy, you've got doctors, you got lawyers, you got all kinds of micro cultures going on. Mm -hmm. So if an employee at Yale isn't really a good fit for one of those microcultures, the odds are you can find another microculture where they're going to be a good fit and feel satisfied. You take a place, OPG small, you know, at any given day, we're about 15 people. You know, we can be 10 to 15. We don't have that flexibility. And we have a we have clients that expect a certain type of behavior. That's what we're selling. So I think leaders have to stop and think about what's what's the bright line and what are the softer lines, the gray areas. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in some of the work that you've done in the past, you've you've made reference to two things, to two games. One is checkers <laughs> and one is chess. And how you can apply that thought those that the, that that framework to understand. What is your business model? What is your culture? What is your people? And then, I mean, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually drawing a blank on where I was talking about che checkers and chess. I'm not sure. It's, I don't think it's in the book. Hilton, where did you, did you no, see no, it in the no. book? I was, reading, I was reading an article about, uh, about you and what you do. So if you think about it, I'll, 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 I'll pick it up oh, yeah. in terms of, so basically, if you treat all your employees like, monotone checkers mm. pieces yeah okay um where you can replace a red with another red it doesn't really matter it's just you just plug and play another person a yeah. lot of those type of cultures business cultures do exist today yes on the other hand you've got chess which is a lineup of your leaders different roles different characteristics they all move in different ways yeah so this is where I, I picked up on that and I said, well, okay, this is yeah. where this is the abundance model is the chess model. Mm -hmm. this model is the, the checkers model. Would that be yeah. that? Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not that may have been somebody writing about my work that mentioned that. Because yeah. that's not a metaphor I usually use, but let me let me jump off off off. Let me jump on it and, and run yeah. with it a little bit. Um I would suggest to add more game boards to that metaphor. So I think of the Japanese game Go, you mm -hmm. know, I think of backgammon. I think if you're going to use a game board metaphor to think about your organization, it's helpful to think about which game fits your organization's needs. Take mm -hmm. Amazon, for example, which, you know, it, it's a brilliant business model. Of course, I have huge issues with their pay and some other things, you know, that their income equality issues. But uh, take Amazon. Are they a checkers? Should they be a checkers board? Is that the right thing that fits their business model? But if you are a checker board, if you are a checkers organization, how can you make that be a productive moment for the people who are on that board? How do you help them springboard to the next thing? How do you help them improve wherever they were when they entered, economically, education-wise, well-being-wise, and give them a game-changing experience, even if it's 90 days or if it's two years. McDonald's has almost 100% turnover, but it helps people when it does it right. It helps people prepare for the work world. It gives them that first experience. 
Now we could go into long arguments about whether you want that to be your first experience, <laughs> but you get my point. I, yeah. So I don't think everyone can say we're going to be a chessboard, every organization. But how do you make that game, that experience for people on that board to be meaningful and powerful? And one of the things I, I might veer us off into discussing as jumping off of this is the role that, or, that businesses and organizations have now in running the world. Our governments are really in turmoil, not all of them, but many of them are so weakened by polarization and conflict and the autocracies that businesses and organizations are starting to run the countries and they mm -hmm. have this credible opportunity and responsibility to behave in ways that further a civil society. That's a big statement. Let me stop there. <laughs> I know. You took your chess yeah. and checkers and I ran with it in another direction. You have no, to no, tell no, me. I totally understand what you what you're saying. I mean, if you look at in terms of leadership strategies, and so when you know you we talk about when opportunities arise, or conversely, mm -hmm. when we we face adversity at work, okay, yeah. in our lives, we experience various emotions from excitement to eagerness to fear, anxiety. And the various mental models and are, 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 are essentially the balance of the, the feelings that we have and the spectrum of that optimism, that pessimism. Yeah. And as a leader, how do you, you're sitting in the middle of trying to manage this broad, I mean, you mentioned the extreme, being pushed to the extremes. How do we manage and prioritize where possible? How can we? provide that mental rewiring to make an effective organization. I, and let me ask a clarification. Your own rewiring or the organization's rewiring, mental rewiring, or both? Let's say organizations, if you are a leader in the business, how do you reorganize your, your, your business in order to deal with that large spectrum of feelings from yeah. pessimism? <sighs> I'm going to go to the last point you made, then I'll come back to the first okay. question, which is the issue of individual staff members being pessimists or optimists, scarcity or abundance is complex. Mm -hmm. There's some theory that says you can't really change that underlying paradigm. I mean, if you have children, I have children, you know, you, they are different from birth. I, I asked a, the CEO of Procter & Gamble once, who the book is partially based on, uh, of your children, which are abundance or scarcity. He has four. And he knew immediately. He said, oh, I have two scarcity and two abundance. And they came out that way. <laughs> I don't know if you have children, Hilton, but you can probably go, oh, yeah, I, I know which ones of mine are abundance oriented and which are scarcity. Yes. The reason I raise that is I'm going to crescendo up to the organizational issue. But mm -hmm. at the individual level, if we can't, deconstruct the scarcity, the negativity, the fear. We have to help people manage the interface between that internal anxiety and issues with the with the workplace. And you can do that through training and helping people rethink the words they're using, the language they're using. Sometimes that leads naturally to some internal shifts a little bit because of what's called cognitive dissonance in psychology, where if we say something that we don't believe, are we are forced to say something we don't believe, usually our belief system starts to change internally. You see this in cults, in genocides. Those are the extreme versions of that, where people all of a sudden start to align with something they didn't believe. So you might see some change, some shift towards a more abundant kind of mentality, language, et cetera. But to take the whole organization there, um, I'm going to mention a team I was just facilitating yesterday. I won't, I won't say what organization, but the... I was facilitating for a team with a leader who arrived in that organization eight months ago and had a different team that was very scarcity oriented from years of kind of leadership issues around scarcity. In eight months, she transformed that team. Now she moved some people around, but half the team was still from the old guard. Half was the new guard. And I had facilitated the older team and I had just facilitated this newer team. It was night and day. Night and day difference. She's an abundance leader. Now, how did she do it? 
Well, she made some tough decisions about some people she felt just weren't maybe going to have the competencies, weren't going to have the style, the optimism. But she also changed how she she brought her leadership style into this setting, which was different than the old one. Much more communication, transparency. You know, one of her mottos is, I will tell you everything I can. It's a great phrase. There's some stuff I can't. It's not legal. It's not ready to go out. Anything I can tell you, I will tell you. She convenes the team. She works on having a team. They have norms for behavior. 80% of teams, even the top ones, don't have articulated norms. That's all abundance behavior. It's managing well. It's building teams. You know, it's holding people accountable for certain, you know, behaviors, those things. So at the team level, that's how you start to change things. You take all those behaviors up another level to the top CEO suite. And she's in the C, she's in the C suite, but take it up to the CEO level. Mm-hmm. If if you go look at the book at those 26 abundance behaviors, you start to manifest those. You don't criticize people in front of other people. You protect your staff from abusive conditions. And your staff, when you're at the top, means everybody in the organization. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example of this. I'll give you two examples. I was working. Um, in a, a nonprofit or arts organization once. And I was doing strategic planning. So I was going there very regularly. And every time I entered, you had to enter from the basement because of security issues and get, get you know, brought in and all that. Mm-hmm. I would walk by this office that had no windows and three people were sitting there. And I asked about it. And they said, oh yeah, that's the copy room. And those folks have been there for 20 years. Right, so you you have the same reaction. Yeah. Now, is it abusive? No, but it's stuff we take for granted. And abundance leaders, abundance leaders really notice things. There's a Buddhist practice called careful observation of the obvious. Careful observation of the obvious. What it calls us to do is to not take things for granted that we see all the time. Now, you can't do this practice all the time because you'd be exhausted and we are Mm -hmm. biologically programmed to zone out visual white noise and focus on what might be important yes but occasionally we want to go and say what if i were looking at this fresh which is what artists are taught to do all the time so i'm fresh to that space and i'm walking by and i notice this brought it up with the director and he said oh my gosh just yeah hello that's a problem Another, I'll give you another example, top leadership, thinking about how they can change the world with one decision. They can change their entire community and change their organization. Again, I was strategic planning, doing strategic planning with the C-suite organization. We started talking about their frontline people who are the interface with their customers, one of the primary interfaces. And it happens to be the guards in this industry are the primary interface. And I asked, how much are you paying them? He said, well, we pay the market, which is minimum wage. And I said, why? I said, could you afford to pay them more? And they said, yeah, we could afford to pay them more. But, you know, we would have this comp structure and we have grades and we don't want to, you know, all that, that rhetoric that Mm -hmm. HR folks use. And I've been in HR. I'm not bashing my HR colleagues, but there's a whole HR speak that they all know, right? Change the salary, set the higher, they change, set a higher minimum salary. Mm-hmm. And at OPG, we have a minimum salary also. No one will earn below that. It's well above minimum wage. No one will earn less than a livable wage. Those are two mm-hmm. different things. That's the kind of thinking an abundance leader does. I'm going to change their lives and I'm going to change the community because when they go home, they have money to put food on the table. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So let me stop. That's a long answer to that question. You talk about looking at things from a completely different perspective, trying to look at it from an abundance perspective. You talk about thought, you know, leadership, you talk about C-suite, et cetera. And it's it's a pyramid. Right. What happens if you shift the pyramid around where you effectively have got that support mechanism of enablers and empowerers at the bottom supporting the organization oh my gosh this is one of my favorite topics okay this is this is great uh and i don't talk about this so much 
in the book, but I, when I went to do my doctoral work, I thought I was going to write about hierarchy. Mm-hmm. My whole intention was to deconstruct hierarchy. So I have an essay on it. It's up on our website in our resources section. So if anybody's interested, um, and there is also a very famous author named Barry Oshry. And all he writes about, one of the main things he writes about is hierarchy and power. I I just want to recommend it to the viewers. Beautiful writing about what happens, how you see the world at the quote, top, middle, and bottom. And how do you change all that? So Hilton, this is a great question because I will ask my clients often, let me see your org chart. And the ones who are thinking out of the box go, I don't know where to put the top team in the org chart. We just default to top, you know, that, that layers. Mm -hmm. I don't have a simple answer for that because I would argue that leaders are yes, enablers, supports, finding resources, what good abundance leaders do Mm -hmm. also have to lead at the front. They also have to lead strategically. So maybe you turn it sideways okay. yes. and you have the leaders here and here. And then you have the core body of work going on, but you have the leaders, you know, helping with resources, but also they have to lead. They've got to be thinking strategically and seeing the bigger picture on a regular basis. Well, that's effectively what you're doing is you, by shifting it that way to the side, you, yeah. you, you're creating cross-functional across the different silos of each business or department. Yeah. So instead of it going up, which has all kinds of mental model connotations, yeah. I'm at the bottom, I'm at the bottom of this, or I'm at the, you know. And the truth is, we all know our organization's hierarchy. We all know where the power lies. And I tell my individual executives when I'm coaching them, they'll say, oh, my staff tell me everything. And I say, oh, dear, um, that's naive. Remember that you are in control of their paycheck and the food on their tables. There's no getting around that. It's disingenuous to say we're all going to be kumbaya and equals and power, et cetera. It's naive. It's just not true. But you can decrease those hierarchical barriers by using all kinds of management and leadership tools. Mm-hmm. You can at least mitigate that, that is the issues of power and hierarchy. Yes. I mean, yeah. even from my personal experience, and we yeah. were talking about it yesterday, in terms of getting certain tasks done or, or certain um, people in the company to function in a particular role, one of the things that I identified that was clearly missing was a clear vision of why are we doing this? Because I, 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 I wrote down step by step, go to A, to B, to C, to D, then go back to B and then do EFG and check that, you know, it was like a computer, like an you know, being an engineer. I deconstructed uh, the whole thing. Yeah. But I didn't articulate clearly why, why are we doing it. I mean, I said why are we doing it, but I didn't explain it in the context of everything we do. Yeah. That was really, really enlightening for me to understand. Yeah, it's it's brilliant example, Hilton. Brilliant. And of course, an engineer would go, I'll lay out the process for you (laughs) and you can follow it. But if you take a place like Nordstrom's, the department store is very Mm -hmm. big in the U.S. I don't know if they have them elsewhere in the world. They're famous for customer service. Now, all department stores have fallen on hard times in the United States. So I'm not holding them up as a paragon of business success so much. But before COVID, they were one of the best organizations for customer service along with Delta airlines Mm -hmm. and they empowered their frontline people to do anything to make the customer happy. Now, how did they get them to do that? They told them what the vision was. We are here to have extraordinarily happy customers that come back and want to come back Mm -hmm. and you can do anything that you think is going to make them happy. So there's stories of sales clerks driving customers to the airport because they're going to miss their airplane. I bought a pair of shoes back after a year. They were in the back of my car. I hadn't worn them, but I'd lost the box. I went into a Nordstrom's and I said, look, I don't expect you to take these back. I don't want to behave, you know, entitled. I'm just curious. And if not, it's fine. 
And they said, what's your name? And, said, and looked it up and they said, oh, Miss Free Baron Smith. Um, absolutely. We'll take them back. No problem. Would you like anything else today? You bet. I bought three more pairs of shoes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but to your point, if you don't give them the North Star, they can't mm-hmm. make decisions in the moment about what's going to work well or not work well. So you always want to start with that vision and the meta strategy. Yeah. Because it's, when you talk about employees, well-being and the satisfaction and in particularly in the abundance lead, leadership model, you talk about four meta competencies. Yeah. Visioning, yeah. visibility, self-awareness and managing. Well. Yeah, I think, Can you yeah. just expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So when I did the research uh, with a, with a colleague who assisted me, got a glue sec. She's mentioned in the acknowledgments. Um, mm-hmm. We discovered that there were all these different behaviors that constituted an abundance leader. And when we looked at those, they bundled into these four categories. So that's where I like people to start. It's just thinking about: Do I am I working on vision? How mm-hmm. visible am I as a leader? And it's just brass tacks. Hilton, that whole last half of the book is the how-to manual, <laughs> um, which Wiley, the publishers, who are great, they've been great to work with. But I do remember at one point in writing the book, I, I said, I'm going to do a how-to manual. And they went, really? <laughs> really? And I said, you know, you get all these academic books and nobody knows what they're supposed to do. Anyway, so visibility, you can go look at some of these just brass tacks things, open mm-hmm. door, moving around, et cetera. And then we've got managing well. You need to know how to manage. You're an MD that's been promoted into managing or leading. You're an engineer promoted into managing or leading. You've got to go study how to manage. It isn't something people know how to do. You've got to study it. You've got to practice. You've got to build up the muscle. And then there's um, self-awareness, which is understanding who you are, how you come off, and managing that to a certain extent. And that last phrase is critical. I am never going to be the perfect boss for everyone that encounters me. I'm a great boss for about 30% of the staff I've had. Mm -hmm. I'm an okay boss for another 20. And there's about 50 who say, no, I never want to work for her again. Now, I could bend over backwards to try to be this great boss for those 50%. That's not a good use of my skill set or energies. And to become that person... The upsides of that personality would get titrated down and lost. So you, we've got brilliance. All of us have brilliance. And mm-hmm. if we over modify ourselves, we can lose the brilliance. It's not to say you shouldn't work on being a better person, being as kind as you can be, et cetera. But I'll, I'll give you a, an example of my own style. I'm very direct and intense. I move quickly. I want people to have good logic. And I just don't suffer you know, people who aren't, keep, who aren't doing that lightly. I mean, I call people, that, that's not everybody's cup of tea. Makes some people really uncomfortable. So knowing yourself, knowing what, where you can change and where you can't is a big part of abundance leadership. So, so identifying where you are, what you're good at and what you are mediocre at and what requires uh, help and assistance. Yeah. This is where you, from your personal managerial role, you need to identify who who do we bring into the team to fulfill those roles of that management style for those particular uh, uh, people within the team. Yeah, which 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 is quite interesting because we all think of the world in terms of line management. I have a management style because I'm in the you know, the finance and the da da da. You know, I'm, I, if let's assume an abundance approach, and I'm I'm building a team of people around me. Yeah, but I may, as my style of leadership, could fit well into another, you know, business development or whatever. But I'm because of the way we we build these hierarchies and these silos. My management style and the people within those other other parts of the company don't get the benefit of my management style and the role that they're fulfilling. So you're looking now as a sort of a cross-functional leader. Yeah. Managing different people in different teams until you get the right mix. The right thing together. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, it'd be interesting to have your leaders rotate yeah. through different functions. And I think it also, your, your thinking there points out why top leadership teams change when a new top leader comes in. Because they're trying to figure out a team that not only brings great skills and brilliance, but is going to fit with them and the rest of the team members. And it doesn't mean homogenous, it's all white men. That's not it at all. Mm -hmm. But it, and you could have an engineer and an MD, very different training, or an artist and an engineer, different ways of thinking. But is there some fundamental synergy there that allows their skills and brilliance to manifest? Mm -hmm. And that takes work and it takes moving people off teams and onto teams. And Hilton, to your point, as an individual leader, in your career, in your lifetime, figuring out the right setting for you. And let me just say one thing about that, because this seems to relieve a lot of my clients. It makes mm -hmm. them very happy when they hear this. Leading is not for everyone. 10% of people lead naturally. Another 30 or so can learn it. They'll be good at it. They'll work at it. But I'd say about 60%, they're just, it's not fun. It's really hard. And they do it because there's more money usually, or there's more prestige. And I work individually with some of my executives to say, is this how you want to spend your life? You know, Annie Dillard, the famous writer said, how you spend your days is how you spend your life. Mm -hmm. So if your days aren't fulfilling, and I don't mean happy, they can be challenging and hard and frustrating, but they're meaningful to you. you yeah. This is fulfilling then something's off. And I encourage my, my coaches to make a change mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. And in terms of the framework, the book mentions a list of 26 distinct behaviors associated with the abundance leadership mindset. Can yeah. you give some examples of that? Yeah, I have a, I have a few favorites. <laughs> <laughs> the research showed that there were five what are called signal behaviors, meaning very high correlation to being perceived as an abundance leader when you exhibit those five. And um, one of them, I actually have the book here. This is what I'm looking down at. Uh, and I just think we've tagged them. Maybe, maybe they're not tagged on this page. I believe one of those signal behaviors is protecting employees from abusive conditions, which we've talked about. Yes. An yeah. And another one is um, not, is, is not, criticizing people in public, yeah. you know, not, so these, they're really specific, these 26, mm -hmm. you can go read them. And in the how-to manual, it tells you how to manifest them mm -hmm. um, along the way. The other one is also this kind of me, me, me attitude. It's egocentric, me, me, me. Now that's an interesting one. I don't think it's a signal behavior, but the me, 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 me is a scarcity. Remember for the 26 abundance, there's, there's a whole nother section of the book, you know, about scarcity, the other ones, but the me, me, me one, I think is particularly complicated Hilton, because as leaders, we have to have a sense of ego strength and that we're competent. You know, we, we need to be humble and proud at the same time, humble and visibly competent at the same time. Very interesting dance. Now, particularly for women who grew up in my area, I'm second wave feminist. I you know, grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And now we're in the third and fourth wave of feminism. And a lot of the women now are having different experiences. But when I was coming up, if a woman didn't say, I wrote that, I did that, she would never get the credit. Yes. Or that was my idea, right? Mm -hmm. So how you do that in an elegant, non-abrasive way, own your expertise, own your power, own your competence, but not in a way that's damaging and sort of ego-ish based is, a, is one of the dances of a good abundance leader. Well, it's amazing to, to be able to identify and you've really, you've distilled down in the book very, very clear ways of framing things we touched upon the you know the, the the four meta competences and then those 26 behavioral dis and which are sort of associated with abundance leadership mm -hmm. and you know you we're talking about businesses we you know at the moment i think we've been talking about businesses 
um, rather than well, you talk about organizations as well. I know you did a lot of work in when you were on the Khmer Thai Cambodia border and education. Yeah. And moving away from sort of the profit sector to the non-profit sector or the you know associations and clubs and sort of organizations. How does the this abundance versus scarcity or an abundance leader feed into those type of what I call non-profit organizations? Mm. Yeah, and some of the examples I've given in this discussion were mm. nonprofits. Yes. Um, a lot of our clients are nonprofits. So I believe that all organizations are have a kind of underlying patterns and behaviors and drivers, mm -hmm. whether you're nonprofit or for-profit. Now, that's true to a certain extent. When you go from the for-profit to the nonprofit, you've got different income streams. And remember, this is what I always say to my graduate students, money is a form of energy. It's how we exchange energy. And so how we choose to use it is incredibly powerful. Because yeah. often my graduate students are idealistic and go, money's dirty. Money's dirty. I go, no, no. Money's not dirty until you do something dirty with it. Right. It, it can be powerful and amazing. So income streams are a major influencer of how an organization behaves and what it can and cannot do. So nonprofit and you, you can make a big clump of just nonprofits, but there's a whole range of income streams for nonprofits. Take Yale, nonprofit, tuition, research dollars, clinical dollars, et cetera. If you're going to work to change your organization, you've got to understand how the income streams are impacting your decisions and what you can and can't do. And that's where I think the MBA training is so powerful because you move away from a naivete about organizations and you start to understand all the parts of the machine that are driving that machine's particular behavior. I don't know if I've really answered your question, but... No, you know you have it because you know it 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 it, it it's very important that it's down to people. This is the most important thing. You know, you yeah. emphasize the importance of this dual leadership approach. You combining visionary leadership with practical management. Yeah. If you've drawn some parallels from various sectors. You know, you talk about the profit sector, the nonprofit sector, you talked about big organizations and small organizations. And then yeah. reorganizing the unique qualities of a team mem or the team members in that effective management, which is akin, as I, I mentioned when we talked about chess earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, simultaneously, you underline the the lead your the leader's role in uniting people and understanding the common needs and bridging differences. Yeah. Very insightful perspective because it uncovers the need for a very nuanced, it's very nuanced understanding of both what is management and what is leadership. And you yes. To, so as an abundant leader, you need to excel in both those capacities. Absolutely. I, I have two thoughts on that. And I know we're getting to the end of our hour. Um, I write early on in the book how difficult leading is. I think it's in the preface. I just basically, it's just really, really hard. It's sort of relentless in, in that way. Um, so I, I just offer, again, for people to pay attention, whether it's moving them or not, whether it's something they want to do, you know, it, it is relentless. Uh, and the second point, of course, jumped out of my head as soon as I started talking about the first one. Uh, but the managing and leading, that's a great way to put it, Hilton. You've got to be able to do both. you got to work on it regularly. And it's it's a privilege to lead also. And it's an honor to lead. And one must take it so seriously because people's livelihoods and well-being are at stake. And at this point in our evolution as a species, the species' live, well-being, the planet's well-being is at stake. This is not a minor game. We are no longer playing checkers. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we are at one of the most important pivot points in the human history of the human species, I believe. And there've been other ones, but this is a game changer. What we do now in the next, next week and in the next decade and next 15 years. Exactly. It's big stuff. <laughs> It's big stuff, and I'd, I'm 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 get, I'm now going to come back to the subject, and I'd like to speak to you a lot more about this because I found it incredibly engaging, 
um, you know, you've written an amazing book, you know, Abundance Leaders Creating Energy, Joy and Productivity in an Unsettled World. So tell me, Laura, how do people engage with you? How do our viewers find you? So can you tell us how best to get in contact with you? Uh, we have, we've got multiple ways to do that. Uh, we obviously have a website, www.orgpg.com, or it, you can find us on the web. It's pretty easy. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and so is the company. So you can mm -hmm. go there on our webpage. There's a way, there's an information thing you can fill out and one of us will be in touch. You can just email me. I, I love responding to people. I, when I, when I get tagged in some LinkedIn conversation, I always drop in and say, you know, thanks for reading the book. Can I be of help? So happy to do that. We have uh, our own podcast, which we haven't added some new, we haven't added any new material in a while, but there's a podcast called OPG Inspire. And the micro levers that I talk about in the book there are little mini podcasts, five minutes of me talking about those. There's a longer, some longer things on our podcast of me talking about income inequality and some other things. We also have other leaders on that podcast. So people are welcome to go there as well. Um, I'm trying to think. We, do, we don't have a very uh, active Instagram or Twitter presence. We tend to be mostly on LinkedIn. And even our Facebook is not very active, but people can find us on all of those. Yeah. So Laura yeah. Freeburn Smith, the author of Abundance Leaders, Creating Energy, Joy and Productivity in an Unsettled World. Thank you. You're welcome. And it was great to talk with you. This was wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you for viewing and engaging with today's podcast. If you're interested in knowing more about citiesabc.com with openbusinesscouncil.org, Go to our platforms, as well as you can also find me on social media and direct message me, Hilton Super, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And do go to the other interviews we have done on YouTube. And don't forget to like and comment. So thank you very much for your time and engaging with this interview today on Cities ABC.